Uh, if you're visiting with us today, thank you for being here. My name is Kyle. I serve as a lead pastor, and uh, we're grateful you chose to worship with us today. If you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we are uh, going to be covering verse 7 today of John 3. Um, and what we're doing is we're in the middle of a, a sermon series called The Law and the Gospel, and subtitle there is You Must Be Born Again. Today we're covering the verse where Christ just explicitly says, you must be born again. And so um, what we're exposing or kind of have been exposing throughout this series is Nicodemus and Christ are in a conversation, and I'll read it to you here in just a second. Uh, but Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling body of, of the nation of Israel. He is uh, the, the teacher, Christ addresses him as, the teacher of Israel. And so Nicodemus is a high-ranking religious official uh, who has done everything the right way. He's well thought of by his peers. He's well thought of in the community. He's well thought of in, um, in the temple uh, and among the Jews. And yet, he must be born again. And so what's being exposed here is that the law does not save. You cannot obey the law to the T. You know, cross every T, dot every I, make sure you get the law right. One, you can't do that anyway. But two, even if you could, you would still fall short of the glory of God. You would still be in need of something else to make you righteous. You might appear righteous, People might say you're a good man or a good woman or a good boy or a good girl, but in your heart of hearts, you would still be dead. You'd still be dead in your sin. And so that's what we've been exposing. That's what Christ is exposing here in Nicodemus. So we're going to look a little bit more at that today. Uh, as we've been doing, if you're able, would you stand to your feet as we read the Word of God, and then I'll pray for us. <clears throat> John 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born uh, of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You may be seated. Our... Our big idea today, the thing that we're going to look at and just kind of drive home is this divine mandate from Christ that you must be born again. You must be born again. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your word. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the time that we've had in singing songs today that recall your word and recall um, just the, the goodness of God. Recall the effects of the gospel on our life. And Father, what we're going to do now is open up your word. We're going to go uh, into your word, and we're asking that your Holy Spirit illuminate these truths, help us to see them, give us ears to hear, Father, give us eyes to see, give us a heart that is made of fertile soil, that as these words are implanted in our heart, they would bear fruit. And God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, that by him we can know you, we can be in fellowship with you, Heavenly Father. And so we ask that your Spirit teach us today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You must be born again, right? If an unbeliever came to you today and asked, how can I enter the kingdom of God? Or what does it take to enter the kingdom of God? How would you answer them? What, what would you tell them in that moment? Would you be caught kind of off guard? Would you be caught stumbling over your words? Would you be caught trying to reconcile, okay, how do I teach them all of these various truths about salvation and what it looks like? And 
Where do you begin? Well, the truth is, is that it's not really a complicated process, right? It's a, it's a very simple truth. The path to entering the kingdom of God is, is already made known to us. It's not something we're trying to work out or figure out. It's, it's not a mystery to us. It's plain in Scripture how we enter the kingdom of God. To enter the kingdom of God, a person must be born again. A person must be born again. A person must become a believer in Jesus Christ. Someone who is trusting himself or herself on the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And that is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here in verse 7 when he says, you must be born again. And what he tells Nicodemus, he is telling everyone. In fact, the word you here in you must be born again might be said, you all, <laughs> or y'all must be born again. It's plural. He's not speaking direct just to Nicodemus. He's speaking in a plural manner, saying that you, all of you, must be born again. It's possible that he may have in mind the Pharisees as Nicodemus has come to him and said, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one, but, but Nicodemus is alone. So he's speaking kind of on behalf of the Pharisees in this. We know this. We, we know something's up here. And so Jesus is responding, well, you all must be born again if you're going to enter the kingdom of God. You all must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here. So what happens when you come into the world by a physical birth is really the same thing that needs to happen for you to enter the kingdom of God. You need to be born again. You need a spiritual birth. When you came into this world, it was by a physical birth. You did nothing to cause your own birth, right? Right. <laughs> you grew, you pushed, you ran out of room, that's about it. And so that was the only thing left to do, but you didn't cause any of that, right? The same is true for how you enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again, spiritually born, and there's no other prerequisites for entering the kingdom of God. There's no other requirements that must be met. You, it's not saying you have to obey all of the law and you know, profess faith in Christ. It's, it's faith alone in Christ alone for your salvation. Nicodemus is somewhat dumbfounded by his conversation with Jesus. We looked at this as, as Jasper taught us a few weeks ago. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Like he's wrestling with this statement. How can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Like he recognizes, I'm, I'm an adult, Jesus. Like I can't make myself small. I can't enter back into my mother's womb. She wouldn't allow it if I could, right? All the mamas are like, amen. Jesus is saying, do not marvel that I've said to you, you must be born again. Don't wonder at this. Jesus is telling Nicodemus there that he's no different than any Gentile. Now, the Jews looked at the Gentiles largely as dogs, largely as less than human in most cases. They looked down on the Gentiles, and Jesus is saying, you're no different than Gentiles. Though you're the teacher of Israel, though you're a Pharisee, your birthright, your education, they do not negate your need for a new birth. The nature of the man is all the same. The nature of all mankind is the same. This is what God declares in Genesis 6, verse 5. We looked at this in um, Sunday school over just really the last few weeks. We've kind of been examining this idea. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so God floods the earth. Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet there is speaking for God and he says this about the human heart. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things. It's hard to think about my own heart sometimes being the most deceiving thing I know, the most deceiving thing within proximity of me, right? It's, it's the most deceiving part about me 
at times. I say at times because I have been born again. I have a new heart. I still have fleshly desires that are going to deceive me, but I have a new heart in Christ. Amen? And so God is saying in His Word, Romans 3 is another example of this, but God is saying in His Word that all mankind is in need of salvation from their sins. Everyone needs this. And yet Nicodemus is marveling at what Jesus is saying. He marvels at it. And we know he does because Jesus says, do not marvel. Right? The word marvel means to wonder, to, to be amazed, to be astonished by, or to be astonished at. Like he's, he's astonished that Christ is saying, you must be born again. Me? Why me? I'm the teacher of Israel. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm a member of the Sanhedrin. I'm faithful to the temple. I'm expositing your word for people. I'm helping them understand what you're saying. I need to be born again? How can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? What do you mean by this new birth? The teacher of Israel doesn't understand what he's saying. And we know this because just two verses later, Nicodemus answers Christ and he says, how can these things be? How can these things be? Nicodemus is essentially saying, can this demand that you're making, can this thing that you're saying actually be true? And so we have to wonder, why would Nicodemus find this hard to believe? I think we've exposed some of it, but let's, let's think about it a little bit further. It, it's hard for someone who believes themselves to be one thing to be told they're a completely different thing, Right? You ever had this in your life? Like you think, maybe you're right about a situation. You're like, man, I, I know that I'm right about this situation. And then someone tells you, well, no, you're actually wrong. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm right about this. I know that I'm right about this. And then the facts are presented, the argument is made, and you're like, shoot, <laughs> I, I'm not right about this. It's a humbling thing, right, to be told you're not right about something. But what if you weren't right about the whole way you had spent your entire life? Like what if you were told today that all of the way you have exerted your energy from birth to adulthood, from birth to your childhood, wherever you're at in life, what if you were told today you're not right about the way you've been living? You, you say one thing and you live a different, or or you just, you're all together, like all in on just not being righteous. And you're just unconcerned with righteousness. You're unconcerned with how God says you should live. And so you're being told you're not right about this. And yet you think, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good, I'm a good individual. I'm good to my wife. I'm good to my coworkers. I'm good to my friends. You know. I give money in the offering plate. Right, what if you were told that you're not right? This is where Nicodemus is. I mean, Nicodemus is morally upright. Nicodemus is, by all accounts, a great citizen. I mean, he's the kind of guy you want to live next to, probably. You want him as your neighbor. You want him in your life. And he's full of good works. He's li likely outworking others. He's faithful to attend the temple. He's serving God with everything he knows how to muster in doing that. He's the leading Bible teacher of Israel. Surely he's better than others. And yet Jesus looks at him and says, you must be born again. And when a man works his whole life for something only to hear you must start over, it crushes him. You, you wrestle with that, right? You're, you're wondering how in the world. You're marveling at it. How can this be? And, and so Nicodemus, is, he's shocked. And, and many unbelievers feel the same way when they too hear that they must be born again. Because plain and simply, people do not see themselves as someone who is in need of salvation from their sins. They, they may admit the regrets, you know, I've got some things I, that I've done that I wish I could have done differently, 
They may express a desire to do some things in the future differently than they've done them in the past, but they wouldn't call themselves sinners in need of grace. Sinners in need of a Savior, right? Those are just mistakes. They're not sins. Those are just problems I have. Those are things I'm wrestling with, but they're not sinful. And we soften, we, we soften sin in an effort to make ourselves feel better. Christians are guilty of this just as much as unbelievers are at times. They see themselves really as a good person. Stephen Lawson says in his book, New Life in Christ, when you believe yourself to be a moral, upright person, you're shocked to hear that you are headed for hell. Using earthly scales of justice, you are not quite as bad as that person over there, right? There's a, there's a weight in your mind, and you're thinking about, well, you know, I might, not, I might have lied on that test, or I might not have told all of the truth in that conflict that I had, but, but I didn't murder anyone. You know, I'm not a, not a pedophile. I'm not a tyrant. And so in the earthly scales of justice, you start to think, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good dude. And, and when you do that, how can you believe that you desperately need regeneration? Lawson goes on to say, when you see your acts of community service and kindness as earning you a place in heaven, how can you believe you desperately need regeneration? So earlier Jesus has said in this passage, unless one is born again, and now what he's doing in verse 7 is he's intensifying the statement by using the word must. You must be born again. Most of you know what the word must means, right? Like you you grow up in a home that if mom and dad says, you must do this, you must do what I say, and you don't do what's said, and your mom and dad are consistent and trying to follow the Lord and discipline, you receive discipline. And you learn, I should do the must, right? Whatever the must is, I've got to do that, or I must be hurting on my behind, right? That's, that's what happens. And so Jesus is saying, you must be born again. It's necessary to be born again. It's required that you be born again. You are obligated to be born again. You have to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. The only way to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is saying, is to be born again. You must be born again. Are we clear? <laughs> We're clear, right? And so Nicodemus is thinking, though, my morality, my devotion to God, it would, these things will approve me before a just and righteous and holy God. I can present my moral goodness. I can present my kingdom service. I can present my devotion to God. And, and I'll be approved before Him. And Jesus is saying, not only are you not approved, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Not only are you not approved, you cannot even enter the kingdom of God. By the way, Steve, I'd like to retract my decision to say that these are largely synonymous. I don't think they are. <laughs> so I apologize. I set you up for failure on that. Um, <laughs> I think seeing the kingdom and entering the kingdom are different things. I think Christ has been upping the ante throughout the conversation. We, we notice that these works are from God, and Christ is saying, you can't even see the works. Like, like you can see just kind of the physical nature, but you have no idea what they're showing you about the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, not only can, can you not see, but you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And now he's just saying flat out, in case you haven't heard me yet, you must be born again. I think he's increasing what he's saying. And friends, I would be a terrible person if I did not say to you all today that the same is true for you if you have not yet been born again. You too must be born again. 
There's no other pathway for you to enter heaven. You cannot do enough good deeds. You cannot attend enough church services. You cannot be good enough. You can't raise your hands enough in service. You can't pray aloud enough. You can't be kind enough. None of what you do is going to make you approved before God except that you humble yourself before God place your faith in Christ Jesus for your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, and trust Him with your life. That's really what it means to place your faith in something, right? I mean, you all are placing your faith in the chair that you sat down in. I didn't see one of you before you sat down check screws, check the legs, check the back, check the seat to make sure it's all in good shape, right? None of you did. Why? Because you have faith that the chair is a chair. It does what it does. When you place your faith in Christ, you're doing a very similar thing. You're placing the full weight of your life on Him, and you're saying, I trust Christ for my salvation. And I trust in Him alone. But why would Jesus say this is necessary? Why why is the new birth necessary to enter the kingdom of God. like we, We're clear on the must, right? If we're not, we can talk later. But we're clear that we must be born again. So why? I, I think it's important for you to understand why you must be born again. Not only so that you could receive new life if you haven't already, but if you are one who has received new life, you'll understand why it's so important that you become an ambassador of this new life for others. That you talk about it that it's on your lips, that you're teaching your children, you're talking to coworkers and friends and people that God places in your life, you're aware that everyone must be born again. And we don't want to assume that anyone is born again. You don't want to make that assumption just because they're a good person and they go to church. Like, ask them about their conversion. Ask them about how the Lord's moved in their life, lived in them grown them up spiritually, ask them about their win stories, their victories, their highs and their lows. How has the Lord sustained them in times of trouble? Those are the places where you find out if someone is truly born again or if they're just going through, you know, the good southern boy motions. It's important that you understand why you must be born again. So the first point of this, this again, these come from Uh, Steve Lawson's book. The first point of this is that defiled hearts cannot enter the kingdom of God. Lawson says the new birth is absolutely necessary because a person living outside the kingdom of God is morally defiled, being inwardly polluted by sin. No one can enter until he or she is cleansed within. Now, the idea of cleansing is something that Brother Steve spoke about just a couple of weeks ago. That everyone is in need of spiritual cleansing. Christ says that you must be born of water and the Spirit in verse 5. Water is a description for the soul-cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. That washing of regeneration, as Titus says in chapter 3, verse 5, Paul writes there that God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. Again, not because you're Jewish and have all of these things figured out or not because you've been a very religious person, but according to His own mercy have you been saved by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So regeneration is the washing. When you are regenerated, when you are made new, you're given new life in Christ by the power of the Spirit, you have been washed. Your old heart of stone has been removed and you've been given a new heart of flesh. You've been washed. We are stained by our sin. It it might be more true to say we are dead in our sins. We we cannot come to God and let until God cleanses us by his own spirit. Your defiled heart cannot enter his kingdom until you receive the new birth. You have been locked out of the Garden of Eden because of your defiled heart. You've been locked out of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth because of your defiled heart. Your defiled heart cannot enter his kingdom until you receive new birth. 
And this is an issue of God's holiness. It's an issue in your lack of holiness, your unholiness. Isaiah 6, 1 through 5, the prophet Isaiah recounts here his vision of God. And just look at, listen to, or you can look at Isaiah 6, but listen to how it transforms Isaiah just to see the glory of God. Isaiah's writing, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." Other translations say of verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone. This is what happens when you, with your defiled heart, get a glimpse of the holiness of God. You are undone. You're brought to the end of yourself. You're brought to the end of your own strivings for righteousness, and you realize, I will never measure up. You're undone. Isaiah sees the glory of God. He recognizes his own sin. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is how each one of us must respond to the holiness of God. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man with an unclean heart. I'm impure before you, God. God's holiness separates him from mankind. 1 Timothy 6, 16, Paul writes there, he says, God dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. God is unapproachable in light, meaning his glory is unapproachable to us as people of unclean lips, unclean hearts. He's altogether separate from mankind because he is altogether holy and we are altogether unholy. There's a chasm between you and God. That's what we know about God's holiness is there's a difference, a recognizable difference. There's a standard of holiness that creates a chasm for you and I. His holiness also means that He is perfect. He is blameless. He's flawless. He's sinless. James says there is no darkness in Him at all. There's no shadow of turning with the Lord. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, He is too pure to look on man's sinfulness with acceptance. He cannot look at a sinful person and say, I just accept you and all of your sins the way that you are. There must be a mediator. There must be justice done. None of us, again, none of us would look at a murderer and say that he doesn't deserve a trial, that he should just be let off scot-free. Like, let's just let the murderers roam the earth. None of us is saying that. Why? Because we recognize justice has to win the day. Why do we recognize that justice must win? Because you were created in the image of God. You were created with a sense of good and evil, with a, with a moral understanding of what is good and what is wrong, of what is just and what is unjust. And so you look upon a murderer and you say, justice must be served here. Well, God, more holy than us, cannot simply excuse sin. There must be a sacrifice. There must be a mediator. There must be one to atone for the sins of mankind. 
Every sinner, therefore, is condemned before a holy God because of his own sinfulness. And so this is why Christ says you must be born again. You must be born anew. When you look at that word again, it's either anew or from above. I think Christ has both in mind here. You must be born anew, afresh. There must be a new nature about you, and that new nature comes from where? Above. It's the work of God. You must be born from above. You must receive the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, if you are going to enter the kingdom of God. That's the first point. Your defiled heart cannot enter the kingdom of God. Something must be done. Secondly, blind eyes cannot see the kingdom of God. Blind eyes cannot even see the kingdom of God. Lawson says the new birth is necessary because the spiritually blind cannot see the kingdom of God. That that is to see with understanding. It doesn't mean they won't notice some good things about it. It just means they can't see with understanding the kingdom of God. In other words, we must be born again, he says, before we can truly perceive the things of the heavenly kingdom. So every unconverted person is spiritually blind. This is what Scripture teaches. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he says this. He says, in their case, talking about in the case of the unbelieving, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Who's the God of this world? Satan. The mind, uh, sorry, the, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the devil blinds the eyes of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. Satan is making the world seem better than the gospel of Christ, right? By blinding, it, it means not only can you not see, but you now have perception that Things that are awful, things that are wrong, things that are worldly and of the flesh are better than spiritual things. And so you pursue those. We'll get into that more in, later in John 3 as we talk about those who are condemned are condemned because they love the darkness rather than light. That's what it means to be blind. You love your darkness more than the light you're being presented with. And so every unconverted person is spiritually blind. Romans 1.21, explaining again just the blindness of mankind. Paul writes, he says, For although they knew God, they knew about Him, they knew of Him, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They chose the darkness rather than the light. Lawson says, The new birth is necessary because it gives spiritual sight to those who are blind and live in darkness. No one can believe in Jesus Christ until they can behold Him for who He is as Savior. God must give spiritual eyes first before anyone can enter the kingdom. Nicodemus is one of those who is spiritually blind. That's why Christ is saying you must be born again. He cannot perceive even the most basic truth of the Christian faith, and that is the the necessity of the new birth. The the Spirit must open His eyes or He will never enter the kingdom of God. The third thing we see here about why we need a new birth is that stubborn wills cannot submit to God's authority. When your will is stubborn to God, it will not submit to His authority. Lawson says, the new birth is necessary because people outside the kingdom of God are stubborn. They will not submit to the authority of God. Like rebellious children, they simply will not humble themselves to respond to the free offer of the gospel. Their hearts are defiant and unwilling to humble themselves before Christ. They are stiff-necked in their resistance to the gospel as their hearts are hardened in unbelief. And so what we've seen in this series is that when you were born again, you receive a new heart. You receive a new soul. Your heart is not hard any longer. It is now a heart of flesh. And your new heart now desires God and His will. Your new heart longs to please the Lord. Your new heart loves what it previously hated, which is God. And it hates what it previously loved, which is sin. You've been transformed. been transformed. Amen? The 
The fourth thing we see, final thing here that we see about why we need a new birth is that dead souls cannot believe in Christ. Dead souls cannot believe in Christ. The new birth is necessary, Lawson says, because any person outside the kingdom of God is, is a spiritual corpse and cannot believe in Christ. Unregenerate souls are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are dead in their transgressions. Dead people cannot come to Christ by faith. A spiritually dead individual has no moral ability by which he or she can repent. Such a person is incapable of responding to gospel truth. To believe the gospel, we must first be spiritually resurrected to new life. So again, it's important that we make the distinction here of what we mean when we say to believe the gospel. When we say believe the gospel or believe in the name of Christ, we're not saying that you arrive to this place of mental understanding that Christ lived. I mean, whether you're a believer or not in Christ, whether you're a believer in um, by, you know, for unto salvation or not, there are many people who would acknowledge something was up with Jesus. Like, there's a lot of historical evidence that Christ ruled and reigned in the way that he did, that he, um, that he did the miracles that he did, that he taught the things he taught, that he did get crucified, that it's unexplainable what happened to his body, that he resurrected. There were eyewitnesses of such things, right? And so you can arrive at this place of, well, Christ definitely is a, a figure, you know, in human history. He was a teacher. I remember being in world history in 11th grade and hearing about Jesus side by side with Muhammad, right? That these were just, these were men who taught good religious things, and by them, these world religions were started. And but Christ is altogether different than Muhammad, amen? He's altogether different than any other God that exists because he rose again. When, when, when Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, well, let me, let me finish that thought. So what we're saying by belief is not that you just arrived to these mental facts, because even the demons believe and shudder at the name of Jesus Christ. It means that you have arrived at faith in Christ. You've arrived at trust in Christ. You're placing the full weight of your life on Him, and you're following Him daily. That's what we mean by belief. And so here's another way to illustrate this. When Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, and in the book of John we read about this, Lazarus did not come out of the tomb until Christ called him forward. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, or Lazarus, come out. And at that moment, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days, and at that moment, he comes out, and he's covered in his grave clothes, and he tells the people who are standing by, undress him, take these grave clothes off of him. Why? Because he's alive now. But he doesn't come forward until he's Called. And in the same way, a spiritually dead person cannot come to Christ by faith until God calls he or she to come. John 6, Jesus is there and he's talking to the crowds and he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's a drawing that's done by God that brings people to faith in him. And God must draw us before we can exercise this saving faith. In other words, God must regenerate us. We need a new heart for this belief. We must be regenerated before we can come to faith. And the new birth gives you the ability. It gives you the ability to respond to God in faith. It produces a living faith in Christ Jesus. Lawson says this about that moment. He says, in that moment, the new birth gives listening ears to hear the call of the gospel. It gives active feet to run to Christ. It gives receptive hands to embrace him by faith. The new birth gives a liberated will, released from its bondage to sin to believe in Jesus Christ. Regeneration and faith are two sides of the same coin, essentially. They're happening in an instant. When you're regenerated, you exercise faith. John 6, 37, Jesus says this. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I wanted to share that with you because when you come to faith in Christ, 
you can rest assured that you have truly been reborn. And you are his forevermore. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about how he is the good shepherd and that no one will pluck his people from his hand. He holds them. And so Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, do not marvel that I've said you need to be born again. Why? Because in the new birth, you receive a new heart for that defiled heart. In the new birth, you receive new sight to replace those blinded eyes. In the new birth, you receive a new will, one that is no longer obstinate to God, but is yielding to Him. And in the new birth, you receive a new life. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins, but now, thanks be to God, you are alive in Christ Jesus. There were no exceptions for Nicodemus concerning the new birth because there are no exceptions for anyone. We all fall short of the glory of God, and so we all need to be born again by His Spirit. And if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, you must be reborn. Do not fool yourself into thinking that you do not need to be born again. Despite all of your best efforts, you must be born anew. You must be born from above to enter the kingdom of God. Your good works are worthless for your own salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that no one may boast. You must be born again, and that being born again is by the grace of God. If you are already born again to new life in Christ, then do not be deceived by the false teachings of works-based salvation or works-based sanctification. Paul in Galatians 3 is... He's really admonishing. He's he's correcting the Galatians there. And he says this, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, meaning we taught His crucifixion to you. Let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, did you cause the Spirit by your works or was it by hearing with faith that the Spirit was made evident in your life? Are you so foolish then, having begun by the Spirit, begun this new life by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? The Galatians were wanting to run back into Judaism. They were falling into this idea that it's Christ plus all of my works that equal real salvation. And he's saying, have you, you being born of the Spirit, are you now thinking that you're going to be perfected by your flesh? It's the same Spirit that caused your new birth that causes new life. Amen? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham, and he's quoting the Old Testament here, believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So again, in Judaism, they're trying to tie themselves back to the Jews and their father, Abraham, right? They're trying to unite themselves to this, and they're thinking that Abraham was a man of works. But Abraham was a man of belief, and it was his work of being willing to crucify his own son that he showed, I'm a man of faith. Because he said if the Lord would cause him to rise again, if the Lord would resurrect him, he can do it. But I'm going to listen to God. 
And so I urge you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, do not forsake the faith that you've received by the grace of God in your new birth by somehow beginning to turn back to a works-based faith, heaping on yourself condemnation because of your works. Rather, do your good works. I'm not saying give up good works. That's not scriptural either. But you do your good works as one who is a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul follows up in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which I read a moment ago in verse 10. He says, for we are His workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ to do the works which He's prepared beforehand. And so we do good works because we're a new creation in Christ. We don't do good works to become new creations in Christ or to hang on to our new creation. Amen?